here with rentprep.com and we're back for another episode of Ask a Property Manager and we have Andrew Schultz with us here as always. How you doing, Andrew? Good. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, woke up a little early, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I might have been up since two. So that's, that's, I went to bed at like midnight, so... Yeah. So uh, forgive me if you're watching and, uh, you know, I trip up a little bit here today, but, um, you know, we'll uh, we'll get right into it. We'll wait until the end of the episode to talk about the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> that way people can jump off if they don't want to listen to us talk about that. Right. But, uh, you got some really great questions this week. Always great questions. And what we're looking at here, uh, let me pull up the agenda here. Uh, the first thing that we're going to be talking about is uh, lawyering up for security deposits. So we got a good question. Uh, let me see if I can uh, add it to the broadcast here. All right. And make it a little bit bigger on screen here for us. And I will uh, read this for us as well. So uh, this came from a new member in the Rent Prep for Landlords Facebook group. And this person had said that they just got a letter from a former tenant's attorney stating that they think the deductions in the security deposit are either for pre-existing defects or wear and tear. The letter mentions they want to avoid litigation and for them to contact a lawyer within 14 days. So kind of just going down a few of the uh, items here that they wanted to uh, mention. They said the amount they deducted was $1,400 of a $2,100 total security deposit. So pretty sizable security deposit. And mm -hmm. they sent an itemized statement of all the issues that they never replied back to. And um, the concerns or questions went straight to finding an attorney. So this person's wondering if they should find an attorney for this or contact their attorney directly. Not sure if it's worth the cost. Any other thoughts on this? Anyone else had similar situations or advice? And this person's in California and they go on to detail that it was a pretty detailed itemized list. It doesn't seem unreasonable, some of the things that they were charging on there. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, Andrew, what are your thoughts? Why'd you uh, pick this question? Yeah, I remember I remember looking at the list and I didn't think that anything seemed too, too unreasonable on that list. So that's that's kind of why I picked this one. This is a good question. Um, this is one of those examples where having good documentation from when a tenant moves in is going to be critically important as to how this scenario turns out. Sure. Um, I know Eric, you and I did that really great piece of content about how to get, uh, how to get through a proper move in inspection, you know, how to take a very detailed set of photos and stuff like that. That detailed photo set is so critical in a situation like this, where you're now playing, he said, she said about a security deposit. Mm -hmm. Um, what I would do is, if you have a good set of move-in photos, take those move-in photos, send them to the uh, attorney, the the tenant's attorney. You know, before and after photos. This is what it looked like beforehand. This is what it looked like after. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Can you still hear me? Yep. yep. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, you know, take the before photos, take the after photos, send them to the tenant's attorney. And a lot of times, if the attorney, like the attorney's going to look at the photos, obviously, if they think that there's no case there, they probably are just going to tell the tenant, yeah, this guy's not in the wrong. Um, as far as do you need to involve your attorney, that's kind of up to you. Um, if you feel comfortable speaking to the tenant's attorney and not overstating things, then you may be good just going directly to the tenant's attorney and saying, look, here's the situation. Um you know, if you if you feel like you need to have your attorney make the phone call, then then go that route. You know, more often than not, if you have the the good proof of the before and after photos, you know, even the ter attorney for the tenant is going to take a look at those photos and say, you know what, I don't know, I don't think that this guy's got much of a, you know, much of a leg to stand on. The the tenant may not have much of a leg to stand on, or you know, if you don't have the photos, the attorney may turn around and say you know what, we should probably pursue this because I don't think this guy has the documentation to back up his his claims. Yep. So it, it really boils down to how confident do you feel in your documentation um, on, on a case like this. Is that That's how I would handle it, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I think this person, it seemed like they they did a pretty good job as far as like giving them an itemized list of the deductions. Uh, none of those mm -hmm. deductions seem too crazy. I mean, you'll definitely, you know, get some issues if you're like trying to get way too much money for some basic repairs um, right. Property. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Hopefully this person uh, will let us know again in the uh, Facebook group, how that turns out mm -hmm. for them. And uh, yeah, wish them uh, good luck with it. Yeah. You know, is there anything on that question about the timeline with which the, the landlord returned the security deposit? Um, I know some states have that, that rule that it has to be returned with the next number of days or whatever. Yeah, yeah no, they, uh, they didn't specify that um, as far as um, yeah. When they were on there about that yeah, the 14 days so. was, was the time frame the lawyer gave them so 
Right, exactly. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that might be, the, you know, that could be one of the plays, too, is if the tenant thinks that the landlord took too long to return the deposit, mm-hmm. they may try to just get the entire deposit back and keep it out of, you know, keep it out of court or whatever. So security yep. deposits are tricky like that. I know you've done content with, um, I can't Where's remember the name of the attorney. What's that? Remember Don Krupens? Yeah, Don Krupens. The you know on the what's what is wear and tear versus what is tenant damage. Um, yeah. You know that's a that's a good piece of content to take a look at too that could help with this question. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah, I learned a lot from Don in that uh, podcast. So check that out. It's actually our most recent podcast, though I believe. So uh, mm-hmm. if you want to research more on wear and tear, I can go on rentprep dot com in the podcast, and you'll find that sitting right in there. I. Uh, Pulling up our second question here, we're going to be talking about two-year leases. So let me see if I can uh, make sure I get the right one up here. All right, Monica, we will add you in. And I just didn't blur her name out because Monica's pretty active, and this is a pretty harmless question. I didn't think she'd mind. Um, <laughs> so hopefully you don't mind, Monica, that we're uh, you know putting your name on this. But I thought it was a pretty good question. Uh, basically, the situation is Monica's got some great tenants, um, and she really likes these tenants, but um, she's thinking about doing a two-year lease with them. Uh, <laughs> but she's heard that this isn't a good idea, um, and she's not sure if the tenants will want to sign this. I mean, what are your thoughts when it comes to a two-year lease? I mean, what are your uh, you know your gut feelings when you hear that? Yeah. Um, first things first, you're going to want to check with your state laws because some states do uh, limit the length of time for a residential lease to one 12-month period without before you renew it. Um, so that's going to be step one is make sure you can even do a two year lease. Um, if it's a good tenant and if it's a good tenant and you're allowed to do a two year lease and everybody feels comfortable doing a two year lease, then by all means do it. If it's more of a situation where the tenant is trying to, uh, to lock in a rent rate or something like that, what you can do is you could do even a one year lease. And then at the end of the one year lease, um, you know, in, in your additional terms and conditions section, just put a clause in there that, you know, uh, tenant has the, uh, the option of renewing the lease for an additional 12 month term at the same rent rate. Um, as long as the landlord approves, you know, as long as the landlord says that they're willing to have the tenant for another year, make All sure right. you have a, a loop to get yourself out of it. You don't necessarily have to extend that lease, you know, just write it, write it better than I explained it, I guess is the way I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. trying to say it. But well, uh, I mean, something you know, to maybe think, give them the option. Yeah. Something to think about, too. I mean, is, yeah, they might be great tenants for 12 months, but it's hard to say what they're going to be on month 33 or if they're going to be right. interested in living there on month 33. I mean, things happen. Yeah, exactly. you know? um, no, absolutely. Things you can't predict. So, uh, yes, it's nice to have that security of them saying they're going to be there two years. But if that's truly what they believe and what they want, I mean there's a good chance they'll still be there in another 12 months mm-hmm. when they're ready to resign another one year lease too. Yeah, exactly. To, to give you an idea, we very seldom ever do a two year lease. So mm-hmm. that's, if you, if you really want to know my opinion on it, I would rather do a one year lease with an option to renew it at the same rent rate, just so the tenant knows that they have that option yep. rather than, rather than just write a two, a two year lease straight out. So that's uh, that's my preference on it. Okay. Right. Very cool. Uh, let's move right along. And our third question here today, uh, we're going to be talking about communicating with people that are not on the lease. So uh, mm-hmm. this one, I believe, is a little bit longer. Um, I will see if I can pull it up here on screen. All right. All right. So let's see. This person said they need advice. They have a tenant who has not paid rent this month, and her mom sends me a text and says, this is so-and-so's mother. I'm just wondering how my daughter's two-bedroom electric bill or two-bedroom apartment's electric bill was over $300 this month. I mean, I'm already seeing some red flags right now. Uh, Also, she needs a rent certificate for 2017 ASAP exclamation, exclamation point. I'm assuming that is, you know, verbatim. (laughs) And she's going to be $40 short on the rent this month because the heat doesn't work. And I think these are all just being pulled from the text. Uh, What would you do in this case? Would you even bother to respond to the mother? Because the mother is nowhere on the lease. And I tried to get a hold of the daughter to find out what's going on. Yet the daughter refuses to answer her phone and refuses to text me back. So would you just ignore the mother and not even respond? Need advice on this one. So here we actually used to have a lot of issues with this when we had our student rentals down by UB South Campus. Mm -hmm. Um, our stance was if the parents not listed on the lease as a guarantor, yep. we don't talk to them. 
Um, they're not they're not a party to the lease at that point. So what I would do is, you know, don't hesitate to call the parent back and say, unfortunately, you're not a party to the lease. I can't discuss anything having to do with the tenancy with you. If the daughter wants the mom to be an authorized person to speak on her behalf, the daughter needs to sign her a lease stating that. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that the daughter is kind of avoiding conversation with the landlord directly tells me that something there's more than more there's more than meets the eye here something something behind the scenes is going on um you know they're talking about they're talking about a 300 hundred dollar electric bill they're talking about the heat doesn't work sounds to me like neither of these issues has ever been brought to the landlord's attention before yeah um this is the beginning of somebody starting to play games in my eyes yeah what i would do is tell the parent sorry i can't talk to you unless your daughter gives us written written authorization not just verbal written authorization that she's fine with it uh and and even then i would be cautious as to what you say to the parent because they're still not a party to the lease they're just uh you know they're just somebody who's who's been authorized to speak on the tenant's behalf so to speak so wow. as far as the electric bill i have no idea um i mean the one thing i was thinking with that any is of maybe, a number of things maybe you if you've had this rental for a while you know go back in the history and see if you can find a previous tenant and ask them what the electric yeah. bills were like because who knows yeah. maybe this or even the, the utility company can pull the historic data on it too so you might yeah. be able to go even right directly to the utility company and see you know is there a spike or it could be something as simple as it was an estimated read like we yeah. get that all the time. We just got a we just got a utility bill for like four hundred dollars because it was an estimated read. Once the bill was corrected, it was like one hundred and sixty eight dollars. Yep. So I mean, it could be it could literally be any of a number of things um, driving up the electric. Um, and then as far as the heat's not working, well, then why didn't they report that to you? Mm -hmm. um, like you can't you can't fix something you don't know about is is pretty pretty standard. So hey. hopefully they can resolve it. Hopefully it doesn't turn into an eviction. Just say. Thanks, David Porter, for the thumbs up. Appreciate it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you there with that. But uh, no, yeah, you're fine. It, it's tough. Um, and, and you you said that before on these uh, episodes here. Uh, that's part of the reason you got out of uh, doing the college housing because you do deal with a less mature uh, tenant, and that can even come down to just communication styles where they're gonna you know use an intermediary with their parent <laughs> to have some basic conversations. So. Uh, that can always right. kind of muddy the waters a little bit uh, between the uh, communication lines. So, yeah, absolutely, it certainly creates a challenge. That's for sure. So, I would say until there's something signed by the tenant saying that she's authorizing you to speak to her mother on her behalf, um, I wouldn't say much to the mother other than I can't talk to you. Yeah. Well, the uh, last little graphic I'm going to put up on the screen here says "Go Eagles," and it's fittingly <laughs> in red prep green. Nice. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think this is interesting and people are still watching. You said that you were listening to the police blotter right after the Super Bowl win. Yeah. So I was listening to a, a scanner feed for, for those of you that don't know, before I got into real estate, I was involved in, in um, fire and EMS and stuff like that. Uh, then I worked briefly in collections before I jumped into the real estate arena. So I was listening to a, a police scanner feed from the city of Philadelphia, listening to their, their channel that was kind of covering the, the Super Bowl madness down there. The, the, they were like ripping the city apart. They were tearing down light poles. There were massive fights in the streets. Uh, just absolute insanity. I like how we're both like um, smiling as we're talking about this. Like, this is so funny. They just destroyed the place. <laughs> well, be, well, it's like we were talking, we talked a little bit before we started. And I, like, if that ever happened in Buffalo, for those of you that don't know, Buffalo made the playoffs this year for the first time in 17, 17 years. So we were pretty excited here in Buffalo, but we didn't tear our city apart. But there's absolutely no doubt in my mind, if we ever won a Super Bowl, our city would just be destroyed. Yeah, um, it's it's crazy. Like even with people jumping through tables and stuff like that, we have some pretty rowdy tailgaters in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. We we're we're consistently voted the best tailgating city in the country. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it would just be it'd be total insanity if Buffalo ever got to that point. But uh, yeah. congratulations to the Eagles. Uh, I was really happy to watch that game. Not a big Tom Brady fan, so uh, that was that was pretty good. Yeah. Well, before we sign off here, I also uh, throw a little bit of a shout out. Josh Randall, he's in the uh, Facebook group. We did a podcast with him on uh, investing in small towns in central city, Kentucky. If you haven't listened to that one, Andrew, definitely listen to it. It's pretty interesting because I know you've been talking about smaller town rentals sometimes. Uh, yeah, like we've Medina been playing with that one there. idea. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he owns a uh, screen printing company as well. So we got some uh, 
hoodies in in the last week. We'll have to get you nice. out uh, a hoodie too, Andrew. And I uh, just wanted to give him a shout out and uh, thanks for putting these together for us. So Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Cool. All right. It was good uh, chatting with you. And until next week, take care and uh, stay warm. Sounds good, man. Have a good week. All right. You too. Bye. Oh, I did that thing where it freezes when you're trying to end the broadcast. And then you look silly. It's, it's still showing as live on.